In the turbulent skies of the Cold War era, the Royal Air Force's F-4 Phantom stood as a silent sentinel, an emblem of both technological prowess and unwavering resolve. A marvel of its time, this legendary aircraft not only patrolled the frigid airspaces, but also etched its name in the annals of aviation history with its unmatched versatility and steadfast service. From the ominous clouds that shrouded Europe to the expansive horizons of the North Atlantic, the F-4 Phantom became synonymous with the RAF's commitment to deterrence and defense. With its sleek silhouette slicing through the air, it symbolized the RAF's readiness to confront any challenge, safeguarding the peace amid the looming specter of conflict. Beyond its formidable presence, the F-4 Phantom epitomized innovation, boasting cutting-edge technology that pushed the boundaries of aerial warfare. Its twin engines roared with the promise of power, while its advanced avionics and weaponry elevated the RAF's capabilities to unprecedented heights. Whether engaging in aerial combat or executing reconnaissance missions, the Phantom proved its mettle time and again, earning the respect of allies and adversaries alike. Yet, beneath its steel exterior lay the beating heart of countless RAF pilots who dared to soar into the unknown. With nerves of steel and unwavering courage, these aviators navigated the complexities of the Cold War era, their spirits unbroken even in the face of uncertainty. Each mission embarked upon in the Phantom was not merely a sortie, but a testament to the bravery and dedication of those who served. As the Cold War ebbed and flowed, the F-4 Phantom remained a steadfast guardian of the skies, adapting to evolving threats and challenges with remarkable agility. Its legacy endures as a testament to the resilience of the RAF and the indomitable spirit of those who flew it. Today, the roar of the Phantom may have faded into the pages of history, but its memory lingers on as a reminder of a bygone era defined by courage, innovation, and the enduring quest for peace. Today, we have the distinct privilege of welcoming RAF squadron leader Alan Banjo Munro, a living legend of the Cold War skies, here to share his riveting tale of life in the cockpit of the formidable F-4 Phantom. With each anecdote, Banjo unveils a chapter of his storied career, offering a first-hand account of the trials and triumphs experienced amidst the clouds. Gather round as Banjo brings to life the exhilarating saga of his time navigating the skies aboard the iconic F-4, where bravery knew no bounds and the spirit of adventure soared to new heights. Okay, so the camera's going, that camera's going, audio's going. I'm going. We've got your going. <laughs> right, we're recording, okay. My name is Alan Munro, but uh, it's been Al for years. I'm an old man now, but uh, I spent my formative years flying fighters. You didn't so much strap yourself in, you strapped the Phantom on. The Phantom was, a, you can't say it was a nice aeroplane to fly, because it wasn't. Um, but it was like strapping a battleship on your ass. You, you got an incredible feeling. A fully armed phantom underneath you it was a massive power and a very, very capable weapon system. Uh, that was good. There was nowhere to put anything. So when, when we did go down the route, we, we tended to shovel all, all our kit in plastic shopping bags and stick them under the knee. They, they, they just, the only space in the cockpit really that we'd take a shopping bag. We also had suits that the safety equipment, uh, suit covers that the safety equippers used to make for us that used to hang on the side of the ejection seat. <laughs> but again, I don't think that was a particularly official modification. I, I had one up to a thousand knots in, uh, over the range in uh, Italy because we, we had a, a little gauge that measured uh, true airspeed, but um, it, it very much an analog manner, and I had that cranked up to a thousand. So I, I got in the ten-ton club through the back door. We, we never got very high at all. The, the spay engine didn't go that high. I think the spay engine was a disaster. Uh, particularly in the early days when they started breaking up because they couldn't take the afterburner on the back. 
great engine for going on holiday in a BAC 111. Useless engine to go into a fighter. Well, the site was rubbish. Um, it, it wasn't really a gun site, it was called a lead computing optical sighting system. And it was a sort of mobile, a, a mobile site that would slave to the radar, but it was very difficult to use, because don't forget the Navy Phantom was built without a gun, and the, the gun came later. So the sighting system that was essentially a bombing site had to be adapted to use in air to air, and it was very, very difficult. Um, it wasn't like the good old British gun site where you, you, you just uh, either slaved the radar or, uh, or just bracketed the wings. Uh, Hunter I've flown, Vampire I've flown with the same sight and the Javelin of course. And they were much, much easier to use. There was no radar warning receiver. Uh, there could have been, there was the US Navy had a very nice notched receiver that fitted into the tail of which uh, our procurement people decided we didn't need. Who made that decision? A lightning pilot. Now later we got a gauge, um, a, a um, not so much a gauge, a, a small scope that showed where a jamming spoke was coming from. Um, it only went into the back cockpit. Who made that decision? A Vulcan Air Electronics officer. And so it goes on. Uh, whereas the, uh, the the Americans immediately put the scope, uh, put a, a little repeater gauge up next to the gun sight. It's like saying there's an aeroplane. We, we navigator saying there's an aeroplane and you saying where? Finally, just before it went out of service, the Phantom was fitted with chaff and flares. Now it should have had that the day it came into service. Did the Americans already have that? Of course they did. So we got a, a very Tesco budget version of the funnel, I guess. We, 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 we got one that was totally constrained by its budget. The, the, the way it used to get into low speed, high drag situations, you had to watch that all the time. Well, it wouldn't pull tight corners, obviously. Uh, about 420 knots, it wasn't too bad but it would never compete with a low wing loader. And we discovered that very early on at Coningsby when uh, the hunters at Wittering were good enough to come up and uh, do air-to-air -air combat with us. And what it taught us to do was that whereas they, they could turn horizontally very, very tight, uh, we had to go vertical. And, it, and in fact, that's what led to uh, the, the Top Gun program and um, the, the fighter weapons at Nellis that learning how to use the Phantom uh, in, in, into the vertical. Um, the, the 104 had to go way further into the vertical just to get around at all. And the Belgians with the past master, you'd, you'd see a 104 converting on you, and then he would vanish. And what he'd actually done was he'd pulled up vertical to some incredible height and pulled over the top and, and come straight down into six o'clock where you couldn't see him and it was a very effective tactic. Talk to me, Goose. Is it like that? It can be. Can be. It can be. You, you were formally crewed, but, and, and you tried to fly with your appointed nav when you went to the simulator with him. So you probably did about three quarters of your flights with, with your crewed navigator. But conversely, it was a good thing not to fly with him all the time because of picking up bad habits. You might not be quite as sharp looking out. You, you, you might have developed a shorthand for calling aircraft. Uh, you, you wanted standardization. And if you didn't fly with more than one navigator, you would not achieve standardization. So of course, the navigator's job was to work the radar. Yep. And, uh, and they got very good at it. You know, find a blip turn it into an intercept and it ro roll out just behind the guy. But what did the navigator do? Uh, what was their primary role? Is it just planning, planning routes? Was it... um, I, I used to reckon that if you landed on a desert island with one, you could eat him. <laughs> I, 
I, I would say there were two. And, and one was when I was on 29 Squadron at Coningsby. And we were holding the Southern Quick Reaction Alert Force. And of course, we never went anywhere, did anything. All the action was the Northern Force at Lucas. Until one day they screwed up doing something or other. And we got a warning phone call that we were about to scramble you to go north, so get yourselves ready. Um, make sure your emotion suits are on and, and you, you, you're ready to go. And we did. So we, with my Canadian navigator, we went off up to the Arctic Circle and intercepted a couple of bears, which we never expected to do. Now, that was pretty exciting. Um, but later in Germany, we, we, uh, I, I was flying with a different navigator, obviously, and we were scrambled to intercept a low-level contact flying in the border where he shouldn't have been. Nobody should have been there. And I found out afterwards that the sector thought it was a helicopter and probably a Russian armed helicopter, and which we, we had every reason to believe that it probably was. And uh, it's a very difficult intercept because uh, you come in high, you've got to find the guy on radar against the background of the forests and the mountains and all the rest, and then get down to his height and then, of course, it wasn't a helicopter, it was a light aircraft taking a shortcut. But then the Germans wanted his registration. And um, we, we, we weren't prepared to slow down because you never know, he, the, there could be an armed helicopter behind him. So we decided that 300 was the slowest we were prepared to do the intercept at. And of course, you try reading a registration when you go past at 200 knots overtake. Uh, we got one letter at a time, and on the third pass, my navigator got the photograph. Um, and then we got pulled off and told to go home. Now, I'd been smoking a cigar when we were scrambled, and my navigator had been doing one of his beautiful watercolours. And he says, uh, God, I hope I didn't spill the watercolour uh, water all over the painting. I said, no, I just hope it went over my cigar, <laughs> which we eventually found in the far corner of the room under a cupboard. Uh, that was a pretty exciting sortie because it was totally unexpected. It put together lots and lots of skill um, that we trained for, but never thought we'd have to do that particular sort of intercept. The supersonic Diamond 9. It, this started on uh, 19 Squadron, whose emblem was a, a, a Chinese dolphin. That's the fierce kind with teeth, named after the Sopwith dolphin at the end of the First World War. And um, people confuse that with Flipper, in, including a young WAF at uh, St. Morgan who decided to make a blue and white checkered dolphin uh, in, in, in a room at night, which he presented at the grand cocktail party just before we left. So we had this blue and white flipper that eventually got adopted by the Germans. And um, it was decided at the cocktail party to take the dolphin supersonic. And at the same time, it was decided that we would fly back as a nine aircraft. Uh, formation. At the same time, it was decided we'd take the whole thing supersonic. And being a qualified flying instructor, of course, they came to me and said, uh, what's the problem flying in a big formation supersonic? Is everybody behind the leader's boom? Or do you all develop your own boom? I said, I haven't a clue. I said, oh, well, let's try it anyway, which is what we did. And we accelerated this, uh, this whole formation um, we were doing 1.2 across the North Sea. And I looked in my mirror and said, uh, Parks, my navigator, Tony Parker, who said isn't with us anymore. Parks, look at this supersonic Diamond 9. And all I got from the back seat was a massive snore. And to the day he died, he didn't believe it had happened. He thought we were having him on. The legality, I have no idea.
Um, that's a hard one. If you don't want to talk about that, the, the, the air officer commanding a living group uh, took me through the mark, pointing vertically downwards at 10,000 feet, uh, which is not a good place to be with the afterburners in. Point, pointing uh, down at 10,000 feet. Sorry? So he was pointing down at 10,000 feet. Pointing vertically downwards. Um, we came out at 2,000 feet. He, he, he basically screwed up. You know, we, we, we were teaching the rudiments of air combat manoeuvring. And uh, luckily, I, I got the afterburners straight out, which you could do from the back seat if you knew how to shuggle them. Um, I better not tell you the rest.